Please join us in welcoming our session panelists to the stage. Thank you very much for attending this session. We're delighted to have you here. Um, you saw the video. This was um, the Human Security Campaign and uh, HS4A, so Human Security for All. CES have been absolutely wonderful. Uh, they're reflecting their values and their belief that the future is about human security for all at CES this year. And I think it's something that um, no other trade body in the world has probably ever done. So we're delighted to see this theme of human security being embraced. This um, panel, um, which has some excellent speakers on this topic of human security and how it links to education, um, are, are going to explain to you the things that they see that are exciting and changing education, that can define education for the future. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Katan Patel. I chair something called Force for Good. I'm also on the executive team of the World Academy of Art and Science. And the World Academy of Art and Science has worked with the United Nations Human Security Trust Fund to conceive this idea of a campaign for human security for all at a time that I think all of us would say has been a brutal time of the pandemic followed by a war in Europe. And the numbers are very startling. 100 million more people are in extreme poverty. Um, 100 million people have uh, skipped school, uh, of young people. The UN estimates that up to 850 million people will not have the skills they need to go into the workforce from the children that we're educating today without radical action. And so that's what we're going to hear about today from this group. And um, I, I will encourage you to, uh, to think about some of the things they're saying and the big themes that it, may, that it implies for every place that you come from. And CS is great at drawing so many people from all over the world for a theme like this. So um, let, me, um, let me ask um, the team we have with us to briefly introduce themselves and, um, and then I'll, I'll ask them to, to talk on the first topic of the challenge. Thank you. Hello, I'm Leslie Shannon. I am Nokia's Head of Innovation and Trend Scouting. And um, a quick word about Nokia. You know us for making phones. Well, we did sell that business to Microsoft almost 10 years ago. And we have nothing to do with the phones anymore. But what we do do is make telecommunications equipment that we sell to the phone companies of the world. And so for us, connectivity and education is all about using connectivity to bridge the digital divide. And this is a place where we are very active globally. Thank you. Frank. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Frank Van Capella. I am a senior advisor and the, the global lead for digital learning in UNICEF. Um, and maybe digital learning and UNICEF is not something you typically associate, but digital learning has become a really big area for us, especially since COVID. It's something we've been active in for, for quite a few years, but since COVID, it has just grown exponentially. We now have at least 250 people across the globe working at least partially on digital learning, and it's very closely in collaboration with government, so it reflects also the increased demand and prioritization of governments, as well as our close work with the private sector as well in this area. Shanika. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Shanika Hope. I'm the Director of Education for Social Impact at Google. Um, in that work, it's the embodiment of work that I've been doing for much of my life. I've spent 20 years in public education, and in the second half of, of, that, of my career, I've spent on the private sector side with a hyper-focus on understanding the opportunity of technology and understanding how we can leverage the power of technology to drive equitable access and to help people unlock their fullest potential. And so the work that I lead at Google today is to lead this large portfolio, global portfolio, focused on this idea of advancing equity for all so that all can participate and unlock their, their, their greatest potential. So that's the work that I lead today at Google. Wonderful. Shanika, would you begin by framing the nature of the problem that you see out there that we're trying to solve for? Absolutely. So it's interesting, and, and I appreciate Frank and Leslie's um, comments about this idea of, of technology and, and how all of us are playing an active role, a role that may not, many of you may not be aware of. But one of the things where I'll start is the UN recently shared in 2020 that there are roughly 617 million young learners. And so young learners, we think of primary and secondary. So 617 million young learners worldwide that are having access, they have access to some form of schooling. 
But of those 617 million young learners, 58% of them are not, do not perform at the level of proficiency, uh, meaning on grade level. So that's roughly 60%. Six out of 10 young people are not reading or computing on grade level. And so that's the context that we are all trying to participate in. And so the work that, the, the opportunity that we're trying to have greater impact on is really ensuring that all students have access to high quality education so that they can be a part of the solutioning for this very complex world that we live in today. We want all students to have access to quality education no matter their zip code, no matter their location, no matter their background. And so that's the work that I lead every day at Google and that's the context, the problem space that I think all of us are trying to, to, to have some, to be a force multiplier, to drive some good. Frank, do you, do you want to pick that up? Because um, you've been an entrepreneur before too. You've joined the UN. You're required to be an entrepreneur in this job to solve this massive challenge. How, how do you see it? What is the challenge? Yeah, maybe just yeah, to, and to add to your points and, and throw some more data points out there, what, what is the challenge? You know, we often talk about the economic crisis, we talk about the health crisis due to COVID. What we don't talk enough about is the learning crisis. There is a global learning crisis going on right now. And there's some shocking data points that um, I think many people don't know about. For example, um, there's 244 million children that are out of school. Um, and, and for those that are in school, a lot of the children are not actually learning you know, they're not learning how to read, for example. There's two-thirds of children across the globe, that's the estimate, who are unable to read by age 10. So there is a massive global learning crisis which got exacerbated due to COVID. It's worse now than it was a few years ago. So that's the context. And I think when you look at how to apply technology, um, you could kind of split it into kind of two ways in which you can address this learning crisis. One is all those children who are out of school, the 244 million. So during COVID, um, we gained a vast amount of experience in remote learning, distance learning. Um, you know, the, the majority of the world's children were out of school, and we can build on that to try to reach children that are still out of school today. And many of those children that are out of school during COVID, they never went back to school. And then there's the other problem, which is that children that are in school and they are not learning. And they're not learning for many reasons. They, you know, they, they, many children, for example, they like reading books. And just to throw one other interesting fact out there, um, we often think, well, if you don't have reading books, you don't, you know, there's, there's so many issues that, that children are facing. What is the relevance of, of digital? What's the relevance of technology? Well, I think also, as we saw in an earlier session on microfinance, technology is becoming ubiquitous. And it's actually more common in many countries for children to have access to a shared smartphone, not, not an expensive one like you have in your pocket, but, you know, like a $30, $40 smartphone, for example. Still, it's a smartphone. And they're more likely to have access to that in the, in the household than they ha they're likely to have access to a set of reading books. And if you have children, if you've raised children, I have three children, you know, helping to, them to learn how to read, you know it takes a lot of books to learn how to read. They don't have that, but they do have access to a smartphone. So just putting those together, that's just one example of how we can leverage technology. There's technology in, in teachers' pockets. They also have smartphones. Technology is becoming ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's internet, which is still a problem. But I think there's a lot of potential to tap into that power of technology, and we've seen it during COVID. And there's some countries, we call them champion countries, that are taking that forward. Um, and I think we, we can leverage it better. Technology is heavily underutilized, but now we know that they're not just entertainment and communication devices, they're also education devices, and that's something that we can tap into. Leslie, you, you're out there looking for solutions. Yes. You're seeing the, the, the leading edge of technologies. What are you seeing that's exciting? <clears throat> One of the most exciting things that I'm seeing right now is, again, trying to solve the problem of remote education, not necessarily earlier childhood, but maybe more advanced technical education. And there's a great example from the state of Nevada, actually. One of the programs that's going on here is the state of Nevada is making VR headsets, virtual reality headsets, available in libraries throughout the states, particularly focusing in remote areas of Nevada, because this is a really big state. And, and in, through the VR headsets, people are actually able to um, get training to become a dialysis technician. And so using VR is a way to train people to use the equipment without physically being present at the equipment. And without that, and the VR thing was like, well, that's kind of an expensive technology. Do we really need that? You can't understand how to work the machine from a book, 
and you might not be able to travel from your remote town to the big city to get the actual hands-on training. So virtual reality becomes this excellent way of getting people in remote areas, still in the remote areas, to have the kind of training in healthcare and in all kinds of other fields to support the people who need that kind of support there at the place. And so this for me is like a spectacular, spectacular model for going forward. Now, where we need to make sure that we kind of catch up with, you know, the state of Nevada is, you know, a real leader in this area. Um, and the Bahamas, actually, they're also doing the same kind of thing using virtual reality for engineering education. But um, uh, a question, a policy question comes out of this, which is, if I've learned how to become a dialysis technician in virtual reality, is that going to qualify me in the state certification process? Is that going to be recognized? Or is the state certification process going to require that I have some kind of in-person thing as well? So this is where technology kind of moves ahead of policy, and policy needs to catch up. Hmm. And so, um, so this is a kind of a slightly different digital divide, but this is the kind of digital divide that exists right here in the United States as well as globally. And so this is where I think that the more advanced technologies can actually really help to bridge that gap. That's, that's you know, if I could... That's very interesting. Right. Go ahead. I was going to ask if I could build on that yeah. point that Leslie, thank you Please. for that. Um, Leslie's walked us through a, a pretty high tech, uh, powerful solution that does enable adult learners to get these in demand skill sets to unlock new job opportunities that, yes, rightly so, would, not, would be more difficult to make available in, a, in rural environments. But there are some additional low tech opportunities that we're also experimenting in models that exist. And one way that Google has played a role with some of the low-tech examples where connectivity is not available or it's very infrequent, uh, access to broadband is not an option. So think mountainous, very rural um, in locations. And so one example that comes to mind of this kind of low-tech, um, broadband-efficient solution, um, Google has partnered with a local um, nonprofit organization called the Foundation for Learning Equity. And this foundation actually built a platform that is a, that's designed to take basically digital learning content, put it on a portable device, so think of a flash drive or a fob. You put this digital content on this portable device that then can plug into really any device, so refurbished um, computers, um, handheld um, smartphones that most rural or indigenous communities may have access to. And what that does is it allows students and teachers to have access to, to digital content that is relevant, culturally responsive, likely in their native language. And these are, this allows these communities to participate and have access to more current learning and knowledge in a way that they, they wouldn't otherwise have access to because they don't have access to connect, uh, broadband or connectivity. So that's one of the low broadband uh, or broadband efficient options that Google has played a role in, in, in providing. And I know, Frank, you've also um, had experience there as well. Frank, why don't you pick that up? Because um, um, you, you said earlier that the, the education challenge is huge and over a quarter billion kids aren't getting the education they need. What are the things UNICEF is trying to do to close that gap? Yeah, I think one interesting thing is that I think there's a myth out there. For example, during COVID, the myth was that the reason why a lot of children were not learning was because of technology, because there's a digital divide, mm. because they don't have access to devices and connectivity. But we did a lot of research, and we found that that's not really the biggest problem. It is a big problem, but the biggest issue is actually all the other stuff, and it's the other stuff that we as UNICEF are working on. Um, one of them is that there's simply no platform, there's no space on the Internet to go to, which has resources, educational resources, in the mother tongue. Mm. Um, that's the case in, in some languages, some countries, but many countries that's not the case. And a lot of governments started creating these digital platforms during COVID, um, often in collaboration with UNICEF. We work closely with them on that. But now we just, you know, it, it, there, there, there's a trend to, in, in, towards sliding backwards. So we've launched this new initiative called Gateways to Public Digital Learning. And the idea is to advocate for education to become a public digital good across all all relevant languages in all countries, and not like one platform, one size fits all, but working with governments to build up their national platforms, as they have done during COVID, but then building on that, strengthening that, continuing that. And there's a few countries that are doing amazing work in that area, and they can kind of show the way. You know, there's the Indonesias and the Mongolias, and, and there is uh, Honduras, Zimbabwe, Egypt. There's a lot of countries that are doing fantastic work, 
And it can be an example for other countries on how you can build on all the innovations that came out of COVID, all the great work, and take it forward and really truly enable um, children, whether they're out of school or in school, to have a space on the internet um, that can connect them, but also offline. And that's another, another issue. I don't know if you want me <laughs> to yeah. continue on that. We're going to pick that up with Shanika. Maybe you can Shanika, continue. Shanika, you, you gave us an interesting little window into an example. But here you are, you're at Google. You have a, a perch from which you can see a lot. What are the sorts of things that Google is doing that is really exciting that will make a difference to this problem? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, having the platform of a Google does allow us to have a bit of a call to action to broader communities and, and nonprofits. That does give us a vantage point that allows us to see more promising practices and nonprofits that are actually trying to solve some of these, these education gaps in local communities. And some of the ways that we've done this uh, recently, so since 2005, Google has actually given over $300 million in, in funding to nonprofit organizations to help advance specifically in the space of education and the education gap. And there are three priority um, areas that we primarily pay attention to. It's specifically this idea around access and, and this idea also around um, ensuring that those solutions are, can they work in, in environments that have low tech, um, low connectivity. So what are some of the solutions that we can provide in that way? And, and an interesting solution that, that we recently supported was this platform called Calibri. And the Calibri platform, similar to what Frank has described, it allows schools and students to have access to content offline. Students can move through that content. And then when a teacher is able to have access to connectivity, they can take that fob insert it into a device that has connectivity to upload the student's progress. Once you have that student's progress, the platform then can also turn around and make recommendations based off of the student's progress. So that the students are getting real-time support with relevant, up-to-date, current content that is gonna help the student continue to progress in their learning. Mm. So this is an offline way to do something like that. So the content, access to content. Another priority area that where we've made investments is really around supporting teachers. So how do we give teachers access to high quality training so that they can understand how to use tools that ready students for, for, future, for, the, for future jobs? And so we partner with organizations. There's an interesting one in Mexico where we've partnered. Uh, it's an organization called Unite. And, um, and this organization works in um, a lot of very rural, remote communities in Mexico. And there what we do is we work side by side with educators. We provide Googlers that also stand with educators and help them to understand how to use some of the, the content that's available through some of these nonprofit organizations. So not only do we provide the philanthropic support, but also the people support. That's really important, uh, and that's another way that we show up. Many of you have probably heard of Khan Academy. Yeah, head nods, yeah. Khan Academy is another partner that Google works closely with. Specifically, Khan Academy has been trying to advance work in Indonesia. And so we've worked with Khan Academy to support their efforts in Indonesia as they're working to provide localized content in the native language of the residents there. And again, as a way to drive not just access, but their engagement and their participation in their learning so that we, they can actively um, upskill and ready for the jobs that the economy is demanding for, for there in their country. So those are just a few of the ways that Google is making investments in this, uh, in this space. But again, we do it in partnership. We recognize that this is not something that we can solve alone. It has to happen in partnership with others. Interesting. Leslie, you alluded to something about the standards that people want to measure against to say you're qualified to do a job. Mm -hmm. And if I pick up what Shanika just said now, it sounds like the technology might be far ahead of the educational infrastructure and the traditions that are built. Is there any way to close that gap? Or are we, are we going to find that actually people will choose to be off-grid and just keep going using the technology to get educated? I think we're, what we're seeing is um, technology is, is widening horizons of people, yes. and, that's, and that's actually quite a, a, a good thing. I remember hearing a BBC interview years ago. Uh, it was a small village in Nigeria, and, um, and they were asking villagers, okay, if you had a mobile phone, what would you do with it? And the adults were like, well, I'd check the price of my fish at the next market so I know when the right time to take it to market is. But they asked a 13-year-old boy, and the 13-year-old boy said, I want to talk to people in other places. 
I want to learn what's happening outside my village. And I think that's one of the most exciting things that the technology and access to technology can bring is the ability to reach children and to help children understand the bigger world and the bigger possibilities of the world before they've been beaten down by the cares of the adult world and, and the need to, you know, get food on the table, to open up the curiosity and build on that curiosity. Because one of the problems that we see, you know, you, you said it, some of the greatest obstacles to education has nothing to do with the actual education or the connectivity or anything like that. It's, it's whatever was there before. It's traditional things holding people back. So one of the projects that Nokia has been involved in uh, with Orange in Morocco is um, providing connectivity to rural Moroccan villages specifically for education. But we're also adding, making sure that at part of that education are modules specifically for girls with areas um, of communication, teaching girls how to communicate and teaching girls about self-esteem. Because it's, it's, it's about educating ourselves, not only about the facts and figures of the world, but the how we can be and who we might possibly be that's different from who we are today. And that's a really, another really important part of education that we at Nokia really feel it's important to include. All right, thank you, thank you, so interesting. It's, I'm, I'm wondering, and I'll pick on Frank. Frank, is, um, Shanika, I'd like you to come in on this too. Is this a third world problem or a first world problem? I grew up in London. And uh, I went to a school of 1,200 kids, and one or two kids every year would get the grades to go to university. I'm delighted I was one of those kids, but I, I just think what a waste of human talent. To, uh, it's not that they weren't smart, but there was something psychological, aspirational perhaps, cultural, cultural, cultural that stopped that happening. Uh, what do you, what, how do you see it? I, I think it's interesting that a lot of the problems, you know, in the countries that UNICEF works on, we see them also in, in countries like the U.S., you know, and, and, and in the U.K. and wherever. Uh, it's just it's, it's, at a, it's at a much greater scale. Um, but, um, you know, earlier we were talking about the connectivity issue. Um, I was uh, actually in my office in, in, in New York. I don't have connectivity for some reason. <laughs> and I was, I was hiking to the Hollywood sign not far from here recently and I had no connectivity, you know. And there's, you know, so I think... You know, a lot of the, the challenges, you know, they, they're also here. So if, 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 if we find solutions to the problems we face here, we can also leverage that in, in, you know, in other countries. And um, just talk a little bit about one, one solution that we've developed. It's called um, the Learning Passport. That's a flagship digital learning initiative. And the idea is that it should be adaptable to different kinds of contexts, different kinds of challenges, no matter where. It should be relevant. So um, it, it runs on, uh, online, um, it, it, but it doesn't require the internet. So we also have an app, and I know Google, we also have an app called Google Read Along, which li likewise actually runs offline. Mm -hmm. A lot of the apps that we use, they require constant connectivity, but we should design apps that they continue to run and function even when offline. So we've developed an app for the Learning Passport, but we've also developed something called um, an offline hub. And what we are familiar with when, when, with offline like streaming services is that you can just stream content, but we want to go beyond that. What if you can simulate the entire internet, like the, the functionality of the internet offline, which means you can, um, you can log on, you can log off, you can track learner progress all while offline. So for those kind of innovations, which are relevant in countries like the US, but they're also especially relevant in countries in an emergency context, especially where there's no connectivity. Um, and we're also working with um, governments to make sure that these become like national platforms of national ownership. That's the key to the success is the partnerships. So we think a lot about scale. It's, it's, you, know, you can roll out a digital learning platform, reach 10,000, 100,000. We want to reach 100 million or tens of millions. So the learning passport right now reaches um, 2.7 million, but it's in a short period of time in 27 countries and it's growing. And the idea is that we want to work with the private sector. We work with, closely with Microsoft and other partners um, and very closely with government to ensure that it becomes actually a government doors, government owned platform. And that is the key to scaling up um, and also to the sustainability and having that ongoing um, funding and support for it. And, you know, if, if, in, when it comes to digital learning, it requires a massive one-time investment to create that high-quality content. 
arguably the long-term costs are not so great if you compare it to other education costs. Look at teacher salaries, for example, mm. building schools, renovating schools. If you think about building a digital learning solution, yes, it's very expensive, that one-time cost, if you want to build something great. But afterwards, you know, it's, we're talking about hosting, streaming, right? A lot of automation. Mm. So I think the costs um, are not so great as many people perceive. And as mentioned earlier, technology is becoming ubiquitous. <laughs> so if as long as we you know, think about technology as something we can access, uh, learning th th something that can happen through our smartphones, not just laptops and tablets, because yes, laptops and tablets are out of reach for many of the world's children for the time being, but smartphones are not. So I think there's a lot of untapped potential, a lot of innovations that you know, have, have a lot more potential to, to transform education than we think. Shanika, would you pick that up? Because it sounds like Frank is in the business of, he sounds like a private sector investor, right? So he's looking for technologies, he's looking to get it funded. And, and uh, you know, my, my day job is an investor, or one of my day jobs is an investor. So I, the most exciting time for me is when people walk through the door with pitches. And edtech is such a popular topic. People walk through with every single little segment that you might imagine and things you haven't thought of. It ways to get people educated. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Thank you for the, the follow-up question there. Um, you know, technology, is, it's a tool. Yeah. It's a tool. And I appreciate your question of, is this a first world or a third world problem? It's actually both. When, when we leave, when the world leaves communities behind, we suffer collectively. And I think our pandemic was a fantastic example of, of clearly demonstrating the disparities that exist and also gave us a very, very real um, example of what happens when we come together as a collective to try to solve a very difficult challenge. The education gap is solvable. Technology is a tool that can help us solve the gap. And what's, what I'm excited about as I think about the opportunity of the role that industry can play, um, and quite frankly, the role of private public sectors, to, to Frank's point about government, um, we all have a role to play in solving this challenge. But what, I, what gives me hope as I think about the opportunity of technology and its role is that we know that technology, when it's used in its best case, is that it helps us to understand through the use of data what the needs are, Technology helps us really to diagnose, can, can be used as an effective tool to help us to diagnose the needs, but then also to drive scale. So once we identify the solution, technology is a fantastic tool to help advance scale. And so what I, as I think about the opportunity and what I know that, that we reflect on at Google is we really are focused on having a clear mind and a clear understanding of the problem that, that, is, that is important to the communities um, globally, understanding the problems. We do that by working in partnership with the communities, but then bringing the best of our strength, which is our people and our technology, to solve the problem that's at hand. And so when I think about how technology can drive substantial entrenched change, it doesn't, for me, the solution doesn't go back to the technology, it goes back to the people. And so I think when I think and reflect on the pandemic and, and how I saw us come together in the medical community, it was when people began to share information, to share data, to share understandings. And then in our sharing, we had greater understanding to leverage the tool that was in front of us of all of the research and all of the understanding of like, how do we build a substantive solution to solve the pandemic? When I think about the education gap, I think technology can be a similar thing. It's us coming together, getting a clear understanding of the needs, and then looking at the promising practices, which do include offline, unplugged use cases of technology, but it starts with the people, and it starts with us responding and having a clear understanding of the needs, and then working together. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the opportunity. That makes a lot of sense. Frank, I know you're reaching to yeah. say something about that. Yeah, if I can just respond to what you mentioned about te technology being a tool, just absolutely. I mean, we, we don't see, digital learning as something that's going to replace face-to-face -face learning, not at all. I mean, there are situations where it, it has to because it's an emergency and it's not possible to do face-to-face. -face. Yeah. 
but in general, it's, it's just a tool that addresses specific challenges that we are facing in education. And just to give um, one example is um, the fact that you know, hundreds of millions of children around the world are not learning at their level. And actually, if you think about it, a teacher's job is really tough because you have to teach to a whole class, and they're all at some different levels. And that's, that's a, a struggle a teacher has and that technology can help address. Yeah. Um, for example, through personalized and adaptive learning, you know, digital learning solutions nowadays can automatically adapt to the level of the child. But they can also give that information to the teachers and to the parents, to the students themselves, so they can see, okay, this is where I'm at, this is where I need to go next, this is, this is, where, uh, this is how I can best be helped. And that is such a huge problem because you have, uh, you just imagine like, you know, a classroom where you have like 80 kids and maybe it's a grade four classroom and maybe 60 or 70 of them are actually at grade one or grade two level. That's the reality of many teachers in the world today. So technology can absolutely help there to, you know, because technology can automatically adapt to the learner um, in a way that teachers cannot do for a, a classroom of 80. And at the same time, it can give that guidance to teachers, to parents. So I think this is one of the key areas where we see huge potential for digital learning, and whether it's in the U.S. or in any country, um, in the countries we work in as well. And, I, and that just actually brought to mind the Khan Academy example, and, and I, I pre I'm so grateful that you, you brought us back to that point and, and the powerful use of the technology, which is these, these intelligent tutors that are paying attention to the students' learning, watching how they're moving through the content, looking at places where they're falling off. Mm. Through the Khan Academy partnership that Google's had, Khan Academy was able to build in those additional supports and helpers to provide that feedback to students. But something else that they were able to build into their platform was also supports for parents. So that when, when students went home, in particular during the COVID, because parents were now finding themselves as serving as teachers, they had no idea how to teach algebra. And so through the Khan Academy tool, they were able to basically build lesson plans that parents could use as an augment to what the schools were providing their students. That was a powerful use of the technology, and it was because of the back-end technology, the algorithms, that understood, here are the pain points, mm. here are the drop-offs. This is where we know mo where most kids get stuck. And so they can build a customized learning plan that parents can use to augment the learning because they're now a teacher, which is hard. <laughs> I, I want to I bring it back to the human security question um, uh, that, that CS has posed and that this campaign is all about. Um, what are the consequences of not solving this problem? Frank? Um, yeah, maybe I, just, I think one of the big consequences of the learning crisis is inequality. I mean, this inequality in education leads to inequalities across all areas of society, and inequality, we know, leads to conflict, leads to a lack of security. So I think that, that's one of the, the big areas, I think, where you know, we should really focus on. And at the moment, if you look at digital learning solutions, you know, there's great ones out there. They are for the elite. Um, the great, you know, there's a direct correlation between the quality and the, you know, of the digital learning solution and the languages and, you know, um, and, and they are for the elite and for, like, the majority of children in the world, you know, they don't have access to anything um, or not in their own language. Or if they do have access to something, the free stuff that's out there, it's not nearly as good, not nearly as engaging. It doesn't have the personalized learning and all those other aspects to it. So I think that's something that if we can address the inequalities that exist in education, we can also address inequalities in society as a whole. Yeah. Same question. Yeah. It's an important one. Yeah, that's, I mean, for me, I think, you know, um, what's at stake is civilization. Um, I have um, uh, one of my closest friends uh, back at home in California. Um, his parents are from rural Mexico. And the way he explained to me their worldview was he said, you know, anything that wasn't immediately understandable, um, that, that we, with our learning, we would understand the scientific reason for. But if that's not understood in, in his parents' village, then what provides the answer is superstition. And so learning is really against superstition, and it's about guarding the scientific advances that we've made and cherishing them and building on them and not letting them go too easily, because that's a first world problem too. That is. That's an everyone problem now. Annika, what are the consequences of not addressing this for human security for the world? Yeah, I think the consequence is freedom and independence. I think if we do not enable everyone to have access to high quality education, it hampers independence and freedom. And I, behind, before we came to stage, we were all talking about our shared experiences, and Leslie shared, um, and I don't want to paraphrase the story incorrectly, but 
she had the opportunity to meet with a lot of uh, various families and communities in India. And through those conversations, the common theme, and maybe it was all over the world, you met with various families, but the common theme was that families want their kids to have the best life afforded to them and to have opportunity. And so we can't solve the global education gap together. We are forfeiting the opportunity, the forfeiting the dreams that are available to everyone. There's an interesting video that uh, Google, we did, where we followed a f some, some students in Mexico connected to this partner, Unite. Um, and we were able to, through, this, through filming, we were able to sit with some of the families and their students. And this father, to the point of tears, described how his student having the ability to have access to digital content through this low broadband way created new opportunities for his family so that they could have new ways to earning potential. It's interesting, with this, within this community, and I hope I'm not getting the story mixed up, the vast majority of the, of the students remained in a rural agricultural environment, farming. And basically, if the student didn't demonstrate specific proficiency by t like 10th grade, they became farmers. And that was, that was their path. But through this program and through this partnership, students now, more students had more opportunity to move on to post-secondary studies. And the father was joyous about that. And for me, that's what the opportunity is, is that we unlock opportunity for everyone. It should not be relegated to the fortunate or the privileged. It should be available to everyone. That makes so much sense. You, you, you've heard it so, Frank, the externalities of, of, of not getting education right, civilization and freedom. I mean, these are big things that we all cherish and value and we want, to ha we want them to work out right. Now, um, we have a very short amount of time so 30 seconds each, if there were no limits and you could wave the wand and, and make something happen, what would it be? What's the most important thing? And I'll start with you, Leslie. I'll go that way. Well, connectivity for everybody instantly, immediately, everywhere. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. I, I guess we already have kind of three, three big dreams. One is, you know... Three dreams, huh? Three okay. dreams. <laughs> give you all three. schools are connected to the internet, and we have an initiative called GIGA to connect all schools to the internet. Then we have our Gateways Initiative, which is that you know, all countries should have a national platform, a, a space where children can go to in their own language and to learn of high-quality resources. And we launched that during the, the UN uh, General Assembly last year with UNESCO and other partners, and we want to take that global working with partners. And then the third is the how, which is our learning passport solution. So we're reaching now, as mentioned, 2.7 million. We want to reach hundreds of millions with that. But not necessarily um, the learning passport in all countries, but working with countries on whatever they want to call their platform, which the learning passport can complement or supplement, or even just be an example of how it can be done. Wonderful. Annika, and your story is so interesting, too. Ditto, ditto. <laughs> um, but equitable access and participation for all in high-quality education. If I could wave a wand, that's what yeah. I would want. Yeah. I love that. That's so, that's so good. Now, all of this comes back to, of course, the, the fact that CES has had the vision to kick off the revolution here that says technology will solve the human security needs of the world. And um, I, no one else did it. It happened here. And all of you are a witness to the fact that this story began here, where the biggest institution in the world that gathers the technology minds of the world kicked off this project. So uh, I want to thank this group, who have been fantastic. And um, I think technology will find the answer, because the human will and spirit is certainly here. And each of these individuals I spent time with them has a fantastic story to tell about how they ended up here and what they're doing. And so um, I hope we'll find all those stories, find the solutions, and change the world for good. And I hope as you go out, you'll be empowered to do that too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.